Welcome to the Money Answer Show with host Jordan Goodman. Whether you are starting out, deep into your retirement, or somewhere in between, the Money Answer Show has the know-how to help you. Now here's your host, Jordan Goodman. Welcome to the Money Answer Show. This is Jordan Goodman, your host. My guest for the first half hour is Dmitry Fomachenko. He is the founder and president of Sense Financial Services, uh, which specializes in self-directed retirement accounts. Welcome to the show, Dmitry. Hey, Jordan. Uh, thank you. It's great to be here. Just give us a little bit of your history before you founded uh, Sense Financial. Uh, sure. Well, my background is in electromechanical engineering. That's what I went to school for. I'm actually uh, immigrated in this beautiful country uh, back in 1996 from the former Soviet Union. Uh, uh, so, uh, electromechanical uh, engineering it was my background. Went to uh, school here, uh, got some additional classes, translated my degree, and then I was uh, um, basically introduced to the uh, idea of real estate investing. Uh, started doing that and uh, also got into financial services about the same time. And then a few years later, I transitioned uh, full-time into real estate. And because of my uh, background and experience, was asked to lead a department uh, providing self-directed uh, retirement accounts to our investors uh, at the company that I worked for. And then uh, about a year later, I went on my own and started Sense Financial. And so that's what I do full-time now. We Basically, our niche is a, a self-directed retirement accounts with checkbook control. Very good. Let's just start with the basics. What is different about a self-directed IRA than a traditional IRA? Well, uh, a truly self-directed IRA is uh, the, the, the one that allows you to invest in alternative assets. Uh, a conventional IRA, uh, which can be a traditional IRA, RAT IRA, simple IRA, SEP IRA, let's call it a conventional retirement account. And, and can be 401k can go into that group as well. So conventional retirement accounts, they... Um, uh, held by the custodian uh, who limits your investment options. And investment options are confined always to the stock market. Now, a self-directed or a truly self-directed IRA or 401k, on the other hand, allows you to invest in virtually anything. And some of the most common investments will be uh, real estate, like rental property, or maybe large multifamily syndications, private lending, Precious metals, uh, even uh, cryptocurrency, uh, self-storage facilities, and so on and so forth. Are there some things that are not allowed? I think collectibles, for example, are not allowed in a self-directed Yeah, way. so uh, when it comes to the rules, um, IRS actually does not have a list of uh, uh, basically permitted investments. You can invest in virtually anything that you want. Again, IRS doesn't give you a list of what you can invest. And uh, the, the list, uh, the limit is uh, provided by the custodian. Custodian is the one that limits your investment options. So um, most people have or believe that they can only invest in the stock market because the conventional uh, financial institutions condition us to believe that that's the only choice. Uh, and so custodian has the power to limit your investment options. Uh, and they do that uh, to the stock market because that's how they make money. But you can certainly do a lot more than that. And IRS actually has a list of uh, not allowed um, investments. And, and that list is co uh, uh, collectibles, uh, life insurance contracts, and, and S corporation because you, you can't you have to be a physical person to invest in the S corporation. So other than those limitations, you can invest in virtually anything. And the other limitation that you must be aware of is a disqualified person. Basically, immediate family members of the account holder cannot be involved in the transaction with an IRA or 401k. Yeah. So there are several companies that offer self-directed uh, IRA custodianship. What makes Sense Financial different than the other ones that are doing that? Uh, well, as I mentioned, our niche is a checkbook control. Uh, there are uh, custodians who specialize in self-directed retirement accounts. And uh, uh, again, custodian's role is to hold, to have the custody of an IRA. Custodian is required for, for an IRA, uh, but for the 401k, custodian is not required. So uh, majority of our clients, they um, select a self-directed solo 401k, which is a 
uh, also qualified retirement plan, but it's designed for those people who are self-employed or own a small business without full-time employees. So if somebody is fitting into this criteria, then they can set up what's called a a self-directed solo 401k. There is no custodian needed. Uh, uh, There is a trust set up instead of a trust company, which is a custodian. A trust is set up for the 401k and client as the trustee controls that. So the, the, the benefit is that custodian is eliminated, is out of the picture. So there is no custodian fees. There is no transaction fees and there is no asset-based fees. Custodian has, uh, I'm sorry, the client has full control over his or her own retirement account without uh, involvement of the custodian. So Sense Financial helps them set up a solo, a self-directed solo 401k. Uh, yes, our role is a document provider when it comes to the solo 401k. We provide uh, IRS compliant plan documents and our role is to keep those documents updated with the IRS. We do annual reporting to the IRS and ensure that your plan is IRS compliant going forward. Uh, we, we also provide all the support that client needs in this role, but the client is in total control of the investments. We don't have access to their investments. Uh, we, we are there to support them. Uh, I, I like to compare this with uh, a purchase of the vehicle, right? If you want to buy a new car, you go to the dealership and you look at the vehicle and then you, you go for a drive uh, test with the dealer uh, next to you on the passenger seat. And then when you purchase a vehicle and you sign a contract, you get in the driver's seat and you drive off the parking lot. So that's what our vehicle allows you to do is basically we provide you the vehicle, you uh, sit on the driver's seat and you drive off. Right now, you can still come for service, for oil change and so forth. We are there for you to service your your vehicle, but you are in control. You're not in the passenger seat. You're not in the back seat. You are in the driver's seat of your own retirement account, yes. if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yes, indeed. So uh, one of the advantages of a solo 401k over solo IRA, uh, self-directed IRA, is you can put more money into the 401k. Tell us the difference between the amount of money you can invest in the two different ones. Yeah, so uh, one of the major benefits of the solo 401k is uh, uh, its uh, high contribution limit. So for uh, this year, for 2020, uh, a plan participant can contribute up to $57,000 per year, plus $6,500 in catch-up contributions uh, for those who are over 50. Now, if spouse is also involved in the business, then spouse can participate as well. So you will double, essentially, the contribution limit uh, to to your solo 401k. If you compare that with an IRA, that's $6,000 with $1,000 catch up for a total of $7,000. So it's nearly 10 times higher contribution limit. And and why it's such a great uh, tax shelter? Because, I mean, think about this. If Again, if you're and your spouse involved in the business together, and uh, if, if you're doing well, if you're making money and you, uh, you're paying taxes, that, that's a common problem with, with higher incomes. So if you take over $100,000 and able to shelter over $100,000 of your income from taxes, the bottom line can be pretty significant. It's, it's going to drop your income and that's probably going to result in uh, dropping your taxable bracket. So you'll be paying less taxes in a smaller percentage and significantly lower portion. So it's a great tax shelter. And then you, you control how you invest those funds. You're putting in after-tax dollars, though. Is it like a regular 401k where you put in pre-tax dollars, a traditional 401k, or is it after-tax dollars? Yeah, the, the beauty of the solo 401k that you can do both. Uh, each solo 401k plan that we establish uh, has built in rod component. So essentially, you're allowed to make uh, pre-tax contributions and get a tax deduction. You can also make contributions to a built-in rod sub-account. So you can a portion of the income, portion of the contributions can go into a rod account. So you you contribute post-tax. You don't get the tax deduction for this money, but uh, it's going into a rod account, and then you invest tax-free for the rest of your life. So there's two choices. There's a solo 401k that's like the traditional one with pre-tax dollars, and then there's one, a Roth, in effect, solo 401k, where you're putting in 
after tax dollars. And you can only do one or the other. Is that right? Uh, well, uh, the um, if we try to dig that a little bit deeper, there is two components with the 401k, uh, with the solo 401k. You can the first component that you contribute as an employee it's called elective deferrals, and that's nineteen thousand five hundred dollars. And this you can do either or. You can contribute pre-tax or you can contribute post-tax into ROT. You have an option. The total is 19.5 plus 6,500 catch up, like I said, for those over 50. And then the balance of the contribution is called profit share, and that always pre-tax. Very good. Okay. So what are some of the most common things that you're finding people investing in that are, are not traditional stocks and bonds and mutual funds and conventional? What, what is the, the biggest kind of investment that are you're seeing in your accounts? Well, uh, again, I, I actually don't have access to the accounts of my clients. I, I only know based on what they're telling me. Uh, so I don't have any kind of statistical data, but just from talking to my clients, uh, most people, I will say, invest in some type of real estate. Uh, so again, it's alternative investments. It can be a uh, rental property. It can be a, a large multifamily syndications. It can be a syndication into self-storage or uh, mobile home parks. Uh, again, when you just uh, one of the smaller investors uh, contributing maybe fifty thousand dollars to a project. Uh, but I also seen uh, clients invest in real estate outside of the U.S. You can invest. Uh, I, I do have clients who invested in Canada, South America, Japan, uh, uh, India, and uh, Europe. Uh, so you uh, again, it's alternative investments uh, tied to real estate. Very good. We're going to take a break. This is Jordan Goodman of The Money Answer Show. My guest for this half hour is Dmitry Fomachenko. He's the founder and president of Sense Financial Services, which offers self-directed retirement accounts such as IRAs and solo 401ks. You can find out more about him at his website, which is sensefinancial.com. We'll be back after this. You've been listening to The Money Answer Show with Jordan Goodman. If you have a question for Jordan or his guest, please call us now at 866-472-5790. That's 866-472-5790. Now back to Jordan. Welcome back to The Money Answer Show. My guest this hour is Dmitry Fomachenko. He is the founder and president of Sense Financial Services. Their website, sensefinancial.com. They specialize in self-directed retirement accounts. Welcome back to the show, Dmitry. Thanks, Jordan. Now, what do you think you have that's unique is what you call checkbook control. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so um, with the uh, uh, self-directed IRA, you have a custodian, and uh, a custodian allows you to uh, do alternative investments, and uh, you can uh, buy a property, you can make an investment, but you have to go through the custodian to actually to make that investment. Custodian will actually have to uh, wire the funds from your IRA account or issue a check. And some investors find that inconvenient because, number one, it takes time to process the transaction when you're working with the middleman. Uh, and then uh, it also every transaction costs money. There is a, a transaction fees. There are asset-based fees. So some f- people find that inconvenient. That, that's why they come to us because we provide them with what's called the checkbook control. And, and uh, it, Literally, the client, once the uh, plan is established, they will have a checking account uh, attached to their retirement account, an IRA or 401k. Uh, in case of an IRA, it's going to be IRA on the LLC. In case of a solo 401k, it will be a solo 401k trust. Uh, and the client as a trustee controls that. So they do have a, a checking account out of which they can write the check and make the investment directly. Uh, without custodians involvement so they can act immediately they can secure the the deal instantly and there is no no fees and is that unique you're the only one that offers that checkbook control I know there are a number of companies out there um, but definitely it's not well known uh, because your uh, conventional uh, uh, financial institutions they not about to uh, tell you about that. Even uh, many financial advisors uh, and uh, stock brokers not aware uh, of this existence. The other thing you offer is a participant loan feature. How can you borrow against your 401k uh, that you have with Sense Financial? 
Yeah, so the the, the participant loan is basically a feature that uh, many might be familiar with. Uh, if you have a 401k with your employer, if you just uh, have a normal W-2 job with your employer, then you may have a 401k there and you can borrow uh, from, from it. You can actually take a loan. Well, Solo 401k has the same feature allowing you to take a participant loan up to uh, $50,000 or 50% of the balance, whichever is less, and you can use this for any uh, purpose. Uh, now, keep in mind that it's not available with an IRA. You can only take a loan from the 401k. Uh, the beauty of this is, uh, obviously, you don't want to abuse this. You don't want to use this uh, loan feature to go and buy a new vehicle or a boat. You, you want to be wise with your money because you've taken a loan from your 401k that otherwise could be invested. But if there is a need and uh, you otherwise will have to tap into your retirement account, uh, then you will have to pay taxes and penalties on, on uh, early distribution. Uh, just one uh, uh, example comes up. I had uh, this uh, lady uh, who's a client of mine now. She needed some money to pay off uh, high interest uh, uh, medical uh, debt that she had. And, and she actually was going to take a distribution from her IRA. She needed about 10000 and she, her CPA told her, you have to take $20,000 so that you, you, you'll you pay uh, remaining $10,000, which is about 50% for taxes and penalties. Well, she actually had a side gig. She was eligible for a solo 401k. And after I explained her the benefits, she ended up setting up a solo 401k, moving her existing IRA into a solo 401k via director lower and then taking the loan for $10,000. It's tax-free loan and the interest that she's paying is going back into her own 401k. So it's very powerful in the right circumstances. Also, does it make sense if you have several, say we're at several different jobs and you've got several 401k balances and maybe an IRA to combine them all into a solo 401k. What is the advantage of doing something like that? Uh, it certainly does make sense. You can consolidate them all under, I call it under your 401k umbrella. So you can have, uh, you can pull multiple accounts under your solo 401k umbrella and you can invest uh, uh, how you see fit. It, you don't have to invest uh, everything in real estate, obviously. You can open a brokerage account under your 401k and invest in some stocks or mutual funds. But you have the, not now it's simplified. You have all of your funds under one umbrella. And if you need to maybe uh, invest in alternative assets that you came across great opportunity, you can certainly do so uh, when the time comes up. So it, it, it is beneficial. Now, if you have a small business and you make a 401k contribution, typically you, you, you do that in a good year. What if you have a bad year and you can't afford to make a 401k contribution? Is this different than a defined benefit plan where you have to make a certain contribution every year? No, this is actually defined contribution plan, not, not defined benefit. So you're not required to make a contribution every year. It's uh, voluntarily. And uh, you, so you can, if there is a good year, you certainly can maximize your contributions uh, uh, and minimize your tax liability by doing so. But if there is a year that you have a low income or maybe there is a year that you can make a contribution, but you choose not to, you can certainly do so. You are not, again, required to make contributions. You, you have the, the flexibility there. So that's an advantage over defined benefit plans, traditional pension plans, where you have to make a contribution every year. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, the, definitely. Those are different plans. And, and there is a place for defined, uh, uh, defined benefit plan, too. Uh, there is a place for those. They're not for everyone. So that's why uh, you, you can just uh, make a blanket statement that uh, it's good for everybody. you got to sit down, and um, we do offer complimentary consultations. So we can sit down or, or maybe have a phone call nowadays uh, and uh, look at your situation and then make a recommendation based based on your uh, uh, situation and based on your goals. Very good. So uh, a, a lot of people are uh, worried about taking money out and be taxed on it. Uh, no matter how much, say you have a big capital gain or you get a lot of income from real estate property, whatever you distribute has no tax as long as you're over age 59 and a half. Is that correct? 
Well, uh, there is no tax on the distributions from a Roth 401k. Uh, qualified distributions from a Roth are tax-free. Uh, distributions from all other retirement accounts are taxable. So if you're taking a distribution from a pre-tax 401k or a traditional uh, IRA or traditional 401k, there is a tax, but you, you're, uh, if you have a million dollars in your portfolio and you are uh, uh, taking the uh, distribution uh, in a certain year, you pull 50,000, well, 50,000 will be taxable. The, the, the remaining 950,000 will be continue, uh, will continue to be sheltered from taxes. So you yeah, only pay taxes absolutely. on the distribution, yes. Right, but uh, if you have a choice, should you do the Roth first because that's growing tax-free forever and then do the tax deferred later? Well, uh, th there is no simple answer to that. Uh, contributions to Roth are after tax, so you're losing the tax deduction now. So, yeah, it's great if you can do Roth contributions if you don't need the, the tax benefits. The deduction, it's great to do so, but there is a number of factors you need to consider. You know, your current income, your age, the potential investment returns that you generate, and your future uh, tax bracket. So, th that's a question to discuss with your CPA, but generally speaking, the younger you are, uh, the more time you have to grow your wealth tax-free, the more sense Roth makes. Yes, indeed. Yeah. And you can do both. You can do a Roth and you can do exactly. some growing tax-free and some growing tax-deferred. That's right. In the roughly two minutes we have left, why don't you kind of sum up why people should take advantage of the self-directed IRAs and 401ks, uh, solo ones that you are uh, recommending? Well, uh, you know, uh, uh, one of the one of the advantages is the ability to invest in alternative assets, and we don't have to go back to to actually see that. Uh, uh, we don't have to go back far. Just go back to the beginning of the year. We uh, had the pandemic hit, and uh, the stock market uh, experienced significant hit, and. Uh, uh, that's the reality with the stock market. Alternative investments will, will be able to provide you with a lot more uh, uh, stability. So you, you can have more control and less risk. And uh, if you have all of your investments in the stock market, then you have all of your eggs in one basket. And one a very important strategy when it comes to investing is diversification. You want to diversify. You want to put your uh, investments or your eggs in different baskets. If you have a conventional IRA or 401k, then you only have one choice. It's uh, uh, stock market investments. If you have a truly self-directed, then you can diversify. You can put portion of your money. You can leave it in the stock market, but you can take portion and put it into real estate. You can take another portion and do maybe private lending with it. And then you can do uh, maybe commercial real estate. Uh, you can do precious metals and, and so on and so forth. So the, the main uh, thing, it allows you, uh, it gives you control and allows you to diversify. Very good. Well, thanks so much. My guest this half hour has been Dmitry Fomachenko. He's the founder and president of Sense Financial Services. You can find out more about what he offers. He has a free ebook as well, uh, all about self-directed retirement accounts that we spoke about and the solo 401k at his website, sensefinancial.com. Thanks so much for being on the Money Answer Show, Dmitry. Jordan, thanks so much for having me. It was fun. Thanks again. We'll be back after this with Bill Perkins. You've been listening to The Money Answer Show with Jordan Goodman. If you have a question for Jordan or his guest, please call us now at 866-472-5790. That's 866-472-5790. Now back to Jordan. Welcome back to The Money Answer Show. This is Jordan Goodman, your host. My guest for this half hour is Bill Perkins. He is the CEO of Brisa Max Holdings, which is a consulting firm uh, based in the U.S. Virgin Islands. And he's the author of a new book called Die With Zero, getting all you can from your money and your life. Welcome to the show, Bill. Thanks. Uh, thank you for having me. Great Just to tell be us here. briefly your life story and how you got to writing this book. Wow. Briefly, I'm, I'm old, so brief is, is <laughs> that's relative. Um, I, I grew up in Jersey City, New Jersey. Um, went to college at University of Iowa. Um, from college, at electrical engineering, but didn't want to do electrical engineering, was a peon on the New York Mercantile Exchange floor, a clerk. So I was like an assistant, assistant, assistant peon, a guy who basically snuck sandwiches on the floor. But that was my um, segue into financial derivatives and trading, of which I eventually became successful. 
and doing. And along my journeys of, of pursuing money, various things came to me, um, uh, e- either in books or conversations and just deep thinking about why was I earning money? What was it for aside from survival? When would I best be spend it? You know, and how do I maximize the experiences that I want to have given the resources I had? And so I'd been wrestling with those over the years and, and trying to develop a formula or, you know, kind of like a program, like, hey, this is how you have the optimal life. This is how you do it. You know, you, you, end with, you spend all your money perfectly, so you end with zero and you spend it properly. And finally, um, at a visit to a doctor's office during a psychological exam, when I said, hey, I, are you afraid of running out of money? I said, yeah, I hope I run out of money. He encouraged me to stop working on a program, write the book, get the message out, because the message is to save people's lives. And that's how I came to it. And in the briefest version I can possibly give you. That was good. That was good and brief. So this kind of goes against what everybody has been taught is that you're supposed to uh, scrimp during your lifetime uh, and pass as much on to your children as possible and create all kinds of trusts and uh, the one who wins the game is the one who passes on the most. So wh- how do you combat something which is so deeply ingrained and you're going completely opposite from that? I, you know, I, I, I don't, what I do is, is I say, listen, we're, we're going for net fulfillment over net worth, right? And each person is different. How much money they want to give to the kids, if they want to give to their kids at, at all, the things that they enjoy, et cetera. And so what I do is give them a methodology to live the life they want to the max, not the life that I want, right? So there is giving to the kids. There is, um, you know, some saving, right? But mainly it's let's get off autopilot and dogma. Think about your life from now to the day you die because you will die and also you will deteriorate. Think about what activities and experiences you want to have, whether that's charitable and you want to give money to people or you want to go, you know, hike Machu Picchu or, or, or climb Mount Everest, right? And let's put those experiences in the right time bucket and so that you have a spend curve that maximizes your experiences and you get the most fulfillment you possibly can out of your life. So... You know, a lot of this is like goal setting. Like, I want to give this money to my kid or I want to make X dollars. But goal setting is only half the story. It's the why. So now that you have a million dollars, what's that for? When's that for? And so I, I, you know, this book is more about modeling your life, right? From now to the grave for maximum fulfillment. And I, I, it's easy for me to get people on board when I'm saying, when I'm telling them, I'm not telling you how to live. I'm telling you how to think to get what you want out of your life. So how does this relate particularly to the current situation? We've got a worldwide pandemic. People are afraid to go out of their homes, never mind travel or do anything adventurous at all. Has this put your entire version on hold that people don't want to take any risk whatsoever and get the virus these days? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's not a travel book, right? And so the pandemic is actually an exclamation point on the messages in my book. Um, it's about being present, getting off autopilot, and thinking about what you want in each phase of your life. You know, there's certain phases of your life, like when you have young kids or you're a college student or you're a first-time employee or you're building a business, those periods come and go. And certain experiences are meant for those for that time frame. What the pandemic has done is saying, hey – this is not the time for traveling to Paris. You can't go, right? It's taking these things out. But it's given people the time to self-reflect and think about what experiences do I want to have after this lockdown? And what experiences can I have that I would enjoy during this lockdown, right? Because there's, you know, for me, I love to travel, right? That's one of my things. I think traveling is, is life. Um, but that may not be somebody else. But one of the benefits of this pandemic when I was like, wait, I can't go anywhere is, is that I got to spend time with my children since they're teenagers that I would never get, right? Never, ever get no. if there wasn't a pandemic, right? They're like, dad, you're annoying. Go away. I just want to be with my <laughs> friends. You know, that type of thing, right? <laughs> Those who have kids 
trust me, you may go through this. You're more likely than not to go through that period. And, um, yes. you know, that was a blessing. And, and I enjoyed that. And I enjoyed the things I could do, like hiking, which, um, you know, walking and hiking around my neighborhoods, which, you know, affects my health and affects my ability to enjoy future experiences. And so it's about making the right choices for whatever period you're in your life. Now, I didn't choose to be in the period, and neither did anybody else be into the period of life of we're battling a pandemic, right? But there are certain experiences that maybe you would have delayed gratification and put later that you may bring forward, right, during the pandemic and say, these are the things I'm going to do during the pandemic period of my life, and I'm not going to waste that period. Much like I'm not going to waste my 40s, 50s, 60s, or whatever, whatever age group you're in. You have a whole chapter about investing in experiences. How do people figure out what experiences should be priorities? I mean, some people have a bucket list, I guess, is one way to think about it. But how should people prioritize which experiences they should do first and and what's most important to them? Yeah, well, you know, I I incorporate the bucket list, but I think of it more – what you want to have is a a level of awareness. Like what – you know, if you sit down, you know – these are all the experiences I want to have in my life from, 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 from wherever I am to now, till, till I die, right? From now to the day I die, these are the, all the experiences in my bucket list. But there's another step, and that's the when. Because certain activities, as you deteriorate, you may not enjoy, have the ability to, or your, or your mentality may change, right? Certain things change throughout your life, like tic-tac-toe is no longer enjoyable. When you were a kid, it was fascinating. Right. Yeah. And, and, and if you're if you're younger, you know, going out to the club and dancing all night and raving might be fun. And but now that you're in your 40s or 50s, maybe that's not as enjoyable to you. And then perhaps you liked hiking around cities nine miles a day and stopping in. But now you're old when you're older, you may not be able to do it. And so in order to pack in the most experiences of your choosing, not only do you have to identify them, but you have to get the order right. You know, life is like Tetris. You know, if you, if you don't get the order right, then you don't get the high score, right? You don't get all yes. the experiences. And so I, I talk about instead of just a bucket list, but time bucketing your experiences to put them in, you know, three to five year groups and say, okay, these are the experiences that belong from 30 to 35. Best fit. These are 35 to uh, 40, right? Oh, wait, wait, I want to climb Mount Everest, but I was planning on having young kids then. That doesn't seem to make sense. Can't be away for three months. Maybe, you know, I need to push that forward or bring it, push it forward or push it way, way back. But if I'm pushing it way, way back, maybe at 65, based on my health or my conditions, I won't be able to do that. And so this is the thought process that people are going to go through is when you, you know, set up a timeline and kind of lay out your life about when the best time to have those opportunities, you'll start to build a curve. Of, of experiences that you 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 want to have. Also, um, that that type of thinking, uh, thinking about what is the cost, the cost of delaying of gratification, gratification? W- will help. help. Do you think you should write these things down? I mean, should you write a list of experiences, how much they're going to cost, and roughly how many years from now you want to do them? Is is that, was that helpful exercise? Um, yeah, it, it definitely, it definitely is. It, it's, it's, it's daunting. Even when you're starting to write it down and you have a blank piece of page p- paper and you have 25 to 30, 30 to 35, 40 to 45 and so on. Um, you're not going to get it all done in one setting, right? You know, I, I, I wrote the book and I, I'm trying to do, I sit down, I'm like, wow, I'm, I got, I got, I got a big blank from 60 to 65 here where I got a couple things, et cetera, and looks kind of empty. Like, wow, my six, those years look kind of boring, right? And some of them, this is a dynamic list too, right? You're going to constantly coming back to it. Maybe you'll do something earlier. Maybe your mind will change. Maybe you'll discover, mainly you will discover things that you want. You know, I always say that life is discovery. You don't know what you want. You discover what you want. So and you so, said that's an, an app called Final Countdown that you use to help people do this. How does that work? Well, so one of the things, you know, that, in order to get off autopilot and understand like your resources, your, your ultimate resources, which your time and your health is finite, is knowing, estimating when your death date is and being comfortable with that. And I use that app to count down to the day I'm expected to be dead, which I have about, I'm going to look at my phone right now while I'm talking to you. 
you know, if I'm lucky, 12,910 days, three hours and 17 minutes, you know, and so, and so yes, it gives you a sense of urgency, right? Like when you go on a vacation for a week, um, you have, you have a certain amount of time and, and you savor those experiences and you pack those experiences in during your vacation and during your life. As you go through periods of your life, you want to savor each period and put these things in there that belong there. And, you know, when it, we talked about invest in experiences, experiences produce what I call a memory dividend. Um, when you invest in experience, not only do you get the joy of doing that experience, like let's say you hit the game winning home run or you got the first job or you did a piece of art or you uh, dug a well in Africa and you enjoyed that. You also, when you recall that experience, you relive it a little bit. And you get enjoy endorphins, et cetera. It's a dividend, what I call a memory dividend. Often, the summation of the recall, right? Telling, talking about your first kiss, the game-winning home run, the vacation you went on, your wedding story. The, those moments and that experience, those, some of those small experiences of reliving it may add up to greater joy than the original experience. Mm-hmm. So much like when you uh, invest in a stock and it pays dividends, right? Over time, those dividends may exceed the original purchase price of the stock. Yes. The same thing. So when you invest in your memory banks, the good thing about memory banks is you get to withdraw as often as you want for as, for as long, long as your, as memory, your memory lasts. lasts. Very right. good. Absolutely. Okay, we're going to take a break. Uh, this is Jordan Goodman of The Money Answer Show. My guest for this half hour is Bill Perkins. He is the CEO of Brisa Max Holdings, which is a consulting services firm based in the U.S. Virgin Islands. And he's the author of a new book called Die With Zero, Getting All You Can From Your Money and Your Life. We'll be back after this. You've been listening to The Money Answer Show with Jordan Goodman. If you have a question for Jordan or his guest, please call us now at 866-472-5790. That's 866-472-5790. Now back to Jordan. Welcome back to the Money Answer Show. This is Jordan Goodman, your host. My guest for this half hour is Bill Perkins. He is the CEO of Brisa Max Holdings, a consulting services firm based in the U.S. Virgin Islands. He's recently, recently written, written a book called Die With Zero, Getting All You Can For Your Money and Your Life. And there's a website related to the book, which is diewithzerobook.com. Welcome back to the show, Bill. Thanks. I'm happy so to be here. On, you're based on when it's going to, you're going to die. Now, some people live a lot longer than their actuarial tables. And what if you planned to die at 85 and you go to 95 and you have 10 years of zero? I mean, how is this supposed to work? Yeah. The, so, the, you know, the, there are certain risks, um, you know, people are not willing to take. And one of, the, one of the risks that people are really concerned about is longevity risk. And, and that's the idea. That's that's the risk of living too long, right? Right. You, you, through 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 your best planning and and all the actual terribles and the doctors and then you live long. And the the good news is is there's ways to mitigate that. You can do it yourself by like sort of adjusting and having a buffer. Um, but it just as people are familiar with um, mortality risk, which is life insurance, right? The flip side of that is an annuity, which is essentially hedging against you living too long. So you, you, you pay a certain amount of money in as, uh, for, this, for this policy, and then as long as you're alive, you'll see, receive a, a monthly, annually, or quarterly uh, stipend based on the product that you have. So the point isn't for me to like pitch annuities, but the point is, is that let's not uh, duck our heads in the sand saying that, oh, well, I can't do that, and I don't want to plan on, on this because of you know, what if I live too long, right? There, there are products out there to mitigate almost every risk that you could think of that but will do annuities, it better than you. I mean, the annuities today have very low interest rates, 2 3%, something like that. I mean, interest rates in general are very low. Yeah. So it's not going to give you much of a return. Would you rather have variable annuities than fixed? I mean, for, for me, I, you know, I, I've been, because I'm in the finance industry, I've been basically designing my own annuity, 
right? V- via investments, right? I've been basically taking the, uh, the the side of the insurance agent because I believe I can get a better return. I, I think a variable one right now, an inflation adjusted variable one would probably be the best pick um, for the general public. But that's, you know, that's outside. I'm getting outside my area of expertise in, in terms of telling other people what type of annuities to look at, right? I, I, I'm looking at it as like, okay, Longevity risk is really not that significant, given that my spending as I age goes down significantly. And that's in the data. Um, you, you know, all the data shows that as you get older, even adjusting for healthcare costs, your spending goes down. And, and I think most people can look around at their older relatives and say, yeah, I get that. Yeah. Right. So what, <laughs> I one get- of the things you say is that people should know their peak the peak spending years, how do you know in advance what your peak is going to be and how can you plan for that? Well, it's generally a function of your biological age, not your numerical age. I, as you know, there are people walking around who who have shorter lifespans, right? And don't have as great a health, health span, right? There's lifespan and health span, meaning that Five years from now, they may, need, they may not be as mobile. They may not be able to get around. They may not be able to uh, do X, Y, and Z. So that means there is going to be a host of all activities that their, cap, their money, their resources is for that they won't be able to do, right? So naturally, in my model and then on the computers, right, if it looks at your, it looks at your health curve and it's going to start declining quickly, right, and, and sure, it's going to say, hey, start spending money sooner. Start spending money sooner, Right. Because the utility of money for you diminishes much more rapidly and sooner than another person. Whereas another person who has, uh, in great health, a slow deterioration and a longer life, it would say, okay, you're not going to spend money as soon as this other person, right? You actually do get a lot more future utility out of these dollars. And so... Knowing your peak intuitively is like, listen, people know, like I'm, over, I'm a obese, I'm a, I'm a smoker, I'm X, my, my doctor says X, Y, and Z, um, I, I can't walk, I'm, I'm going to have knee problems, et cetera. It doesn't make sense to be delaying gratif- gratification, right? Like it yeah. doesn't make sense to delay that ski trip, right? And I'm just using a ski trip as a proxy for every other type of experience, right? Yeah. It, it, it might, you might uh, delay going to the opera, you can always sit at the opera, Right. But all these other activities, um, you're, you're going to bring forward, right? And yeah. so that thought process, right, is how we kind of start narrowing in on, hey, if I'm going to die with die zero, with you. right, and this is my projected utility of money and my death date, that kind of gives me like, hey, this is going to be my peak net worth year, right? And unless I hit a windfall, right, it should never really go up. Have you had response from the billionaires who've taken the billionaires pledge? I guess that Bill Gates started that they want to die with zero and give all their money to charity. Yeah, I, I, have I had a response from them directly? No, he, they haven't. They haven't called me up yet. <laughs> the, the only the only billionaire I've, I've talked to a, a, about this uh, a lot is is John Arnold, who who I worked with at uh, Centaurus Energy and discussing, you know. Uh, longevity risk, the ability to spend the capital and place the capital effectively in your lifetime, doing larger projects, et cetera. But it's it, they're, 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 his feedback would be 100% rational. Um, if you somehow become fortunate enough to get to, you know, overwork, in his case, which I believe he overworked because he accumulated an amount of money that he could never spend. And yeah. on top of that, it's very hard for him to effectively give it away while he's alive. You know, we have to really ramp up efforts and, and look for big problems to solve. But it can, it's doable. Um, it's just the, 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 um, for, that, for that class of, of wealth, is, you know, it's just an execution problem. No. Not impossible, just it's a problem. What, right? what happens if your kids give you a really hard time and say, wait a minute, I, I deserve... My inheritance, you can't go with zero. I mean, this is what I, I'm supposed to get an inheritance, and that's what you've been working for all these years. You can't leave me with nothing. That, that's a great question, and it's the most common question I get 
when I talk about die with zero. So die with zero is die with zero regrets, and it's a philosophy. It's not, it's not, it's not leave people high and dry. It's live the life you want. But kids, all the kids that are listening with wealthy parents, you should love this book. Because what I discuss in this book, right, my message is, is listen, you don't want to give 60-year-olds their inheritance when you die. That's a random date in the future where you're going to give to random people because who knows what kids are alive and a random amount of money because you haven't really planned it. It's just what I have left over goes to the kids, right? And the same physics that apply to your body, as in your body will mature, it will deteriorate and it will die, applies to your kids. And so if there's an optimal time for you to be spending the most money and enjoying the fruits of your labor, the same applies to your kids. So in my book, I encourage people not to wait till they die to give money to their kids, right? Yeah. But to allocate it according to when it has the most impact on them. When they can, when their when their intelligence and their health is at the peak, so that it can convert that money into the experiences they want to have, right? Yeah. Right. And so, you know, a lot of people come to me. It's like, oh, what about the kids? Whatever. And I'm just like, listen, one of my friends. I'm like, you're a hypocrite. Like, is the money in a trust? Well, it's not your kid's money, right? Like, somebody can you can get in an accident and somebody can sue you, and then you just oh, there goes their money, right? Like, if we're talking about our kids. And this is an experience too, right? We want to plan it out properly so to have the maximum impact, right? We want our kids to have the most adventurous, fun life as possible, right? We want them to have the highest experience points, you know, this theoretical experience points as possible. Yeah. And so we want to look at when does that gift go from me to them? Well, first, on paper, not control, it should be separated from your accounts immediately. Yes. Right? Then... The control is now, you know, for each family, we might, we might debate, you know, well, we're not going to give it to them when they're 28. They're just not mentally mature enough or whatever, right? But at a certain point, you know, when they reach mental, wh- what they're going to be, right? The, the last mental changes are, are, are 28, right? And, and, and the last physical changes are around 30, 33. I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm spitballing it in there. Do- doctors yeah. don't kill me, right? After that point... They're in plateau to deterioration. So this, so this for me is kind of like the optimal age, right? To go, here you go, live your life. I've lived have, mine. Have good experience. Have fun. Get the maximum out of it. Because if you're giving them dollars when they're 60, that, that, that dollar at 60 may only buy 50 cents worth of experience for them. Yeah. Versus when they're in their 30s. Very good. And so I, I, you know, the die with zero way is to think deliberately about all these choices from now to the grave, kids included, loved ones, et cetera, and allocate on a model that allows people to maximize their lives. You, your kids, your loved ones, your interests. Very good. Well, thanks so much. My guest this hour, this half hour has been Bill Perkins. His new book is called Die with Zero. Getting all you can from your money and your life. You can find out more at his website, diewithzerobook.com. I think people learned a lot. Thanks so much for being on the Money Answer Show, Bill. Thank you for having me. It's been great. Thanks again. We'll be back next week with another edition of the Money Answer Show. Goodbye for now. Thank you for joining Jordan Goodman and the Money Answer Show. If you have a question for Jordan, please visit his website at www.moneyanswers.com. And be sure to tune in every Monday at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time right here on Voice America Business. See you next week.